All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Emily Timpey and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. During today's presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you experience technical problems, please use the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. I'll be monitoring that area, especially during the start of the presentation, so I can offer assistance if you need it. You may also use the questions pane at any time during the presentation to ask questions you may have during the talk, but remember that your questions won't be addressed until the end of the talk. So we're pleased to have Barb Mays Boosted with us today. Barbara May Zosted is a meteorologist and climate program leader at the National Weather Service in Omaha, Nebraska, with a career that has also taken her through its headquarters in Silver Springs, Maryland, and through the office in the Quad Cities. She also is serving as the Interim Climate Service Services Program Manager for Central Region. A Michigan native, Barbara obtained undergraduate degrees from Central Michigan University in 2000 with majors in meteorology, geography, and English, in minors in mathematics and history, followed by master's in meteorology from the Penn State University in 2002, and a PhD in climate assessment and impacts from the University of Nebraska in 2014. Her professional interests include climate, historical weather events, severe and extreme weather, and improving communication of weather and climate concepts. Barbara also researches the weather and climate events from all of the Laura Ingalls Wilder books. So Barb, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Emily. And uh, before I even get started, I want to make sure I acknowledge my co-author and collaborator on this project, Steve Hilberg, uh, who is with the Midwestern Regional Climate Center in Illinois. Um, this project was bred out of uh, that Laura Ingalls Wilder research that Emily mentioned, and specifically a, a really hard look into a really hard winter. Laura wrote a book called The Long Winter in, uh, uh, it was describing the winter of 1880 to 1881, where she lived in uh, Desmet in what is now South Dakota. And uh, she describes in her book a very early onset to winter, uh, just numerous blizzards, a uh, large amount of snow, very cold conditions, and a late end to the winter as well. Uh, and I guess also it's kind of fitting that today is actually uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's 150th birthday. Uh, but the study of this particular story led to a lot of research questions, including you know, what data were even available in 1880 to 81, but also uh, was the winter really as bad as Laura had described it to be? And how do you define what a bad winter is? How do you put that into a context that means something? And in the process of trying to define whether that winter was a bad one or not, uh, we came across this need for developing some kind of a scale of uh, winter severity. That scale lets us do a few things. And first of all, it does give us the uh, ability to put context onto extreme winters, either severe extremes or mild extremes. Uh, so that would include the winter of 1880 to 81 or any others of interest. An, a winter scale also could put a current winter into context. For example, uh, if, if it seems like it's been a hard winter or an easy winter, is it, is it true compared to what's on record? How do you compare it with what's in the past? Or how do you compare it with other locations? For example, who's having the harder winter, uh, Omaha or Des Moines, or in the case of this winter, neither one. Uh, a winter scale can also let us use that scale to assess climate variability and change. And, um, you know, people just like scales. It makes things easy to digest and understand. We use scales for just about every kind of uh, extreme weather condition that we get. Tornadoes, of course, have the EF scale, hurricanes the Saffir-Simpson scale. We have a scale for northeast U.S. winter storms. We have scales for drought. So why not a winter scale, too, of the severity? But uh, there are a few goals specifically with the Aussie, the Accumulated Winter Season Severity Index, that we wanted to address. In our case, we wanted the index to be objective. Um, there is impact information out there, but that is pretty subjective in a lot of cases. It can depend on things like population. Um, it makes it harder to quantify. So we decided we wanted to have an objective index for this Aussie, and then it could be used to, uh, as a baseline by which you could compare impacts to travel or commerce or other applications. We wanted the index to use widely available data. So for that reason, we chose one that uses daily data, temperature, snowfall, and snow depth, or in our second version, precipitation. Uh, because we wanted to be able to create an Aussie database for any site that has daily data, which means 
records. We're not just limited to the uh, ASOS record or AWOS record. We can use co-op or other historical observations when we can dig them up. We wanted the OSI to accumulate value as the season progresses, so by the end of the winter you get one sort of final number that characterizes the severity of that winter and then would let us compare to averages or highs and lows compared to other years, for example. Um, and we want to be able to compare not just season to season at a given site, but compare site to site, for example, by normalizing a value. And finally, uh, we wanted this to be a fairly, uh, I'll call it bland or baseline index, that would then be able to be applied to multiple users and their needs. Uh, by keeping it limited to weather and climate data, for example, our transportation sectors can use it just as easily as our ecology sectors without having to ignore part of the index. Uh, one of the first questions we had to ask in order to uh, develop this index was, what does it mean to say that winter started and winter ended? Uh, if you ask a range of people that question, you get a range of answers. Some people are very stuck on the calendar. Uh, either winter begins on December 1st or winter begins on the winter solstice. Some people were very tied to impact type information. It's when I pull my coat out of the closet. It's when I shovel the driveway. Um, and some people thought it was really related to snow, but that might depend on the climatology you're in. So what we did was combine some of these um, calendar-based triggers with weather-based triggers. Our decision was to use a maximum temperature that stays below freezing or the first measurable snowfall of the season. Whichever of these happens first defines the beginning of winter. And if neither of those happens by December 1st, then that defines the beginning of winter. We take the inverse of that to stop winter. So winter ends after the last time the temperature stays below freezing or after the last measurable snowfall, after the last uh, snow depth on the ground melts off, or if all of this happens before March 1st, then March 1st is the last day of winter. We use a point-based threshold, uh, threshold based system that assigns points uh, to a day observations, and then these points are accumulated day by day to tally up through the season. It's a bit like running a score. Uh, in, in some respects, the points are arbitrary. For example, the temperature thresholds we used, uh, there's not a lot of sensitivity to changing by a number or two, but you know, to use five point thresholds was, was our decision. For snowfall, we were a little bit more deliberate because we all know that snow storms don't always occur on a calendar day. They're often crossing midnight. So we wanted to be sure, for example, that if we had two inches of snow on day one and four inches of snow on day two, which tallies up to nine points, that's the same as getting six inches of snow on one day, also nine points. We were fairly deliberate with those to make sure that our snowfall matched up to the way it does fall. The points are then assigned into percentiles through the climatology at each site, and then category names and labels are given based on those percentiles. We break it up into 20th percentiles with a mild, moderate, average, severe, and extreme winter category. You might hear this referred to in the news as a winter misery index or a, you know, a bad to worse type of index. I promised my co-author, Steve Hilberg, that I won't use those kind of labels because there are some people in some applications that think that extreme winter weather is good. Some people like snow. Some, some uh, businesses, for example, or recreational types depend on it. So an extreme winter is actually good for them. So I'm going to really work hard to not use the words bad or, or worse, but rather extreme to mild for the labels. With all that is included in the Aussie, there are some things that are not explicitly included. And these are things that have a high impact in the winter, too. Um, but we are limited to what's available to us in daily records. So for example, uh, we don't get freezing rain in there because there is no database of freezing rain, unfortunately. Ditto for Mixed winter precipitation, I mean, if there was a you know, half inch of sleet, that's going to show up as a half inch of snow or sleet and end up not scoring much when maybe it had more of an impact. Because we're using daily data, wind is not included, and that includes wind chills or blowing snow. Um, you know, the wind is really important in the winter climatology of some regions, especially out on the open plains. And uh, that is a limitation of this, but it's something we couldn't avoid uh, if we wanted to be able to apply this to co-op sites and, and many locations and not just limit it to the ASOS record. 
Uh, some other winter types that aren't included, freezing fog and deposition, of course. And then uh, any snow melt that freezes on roads or other surfaces overnight, that's also really hard to quantify just about any time, but those aren't explicitly included. So it is an uh, impact index uh, in that it includes a lot of the high impact weather we get, cold snaps and snow. But there are certainly things that are excluded and we acknowledge that. So how do we use Aussie? What does it look like? Uh, we're going to go into a single site analysis just to show you what our data would look like. And I'm using Omaha, of course, because it's local to me and the site I've studied the most. Uh, but this data, these data are available for a couple dozen sites around the country. When you look at Omaha's record from the winter of 1950 to 51 through the past winter, 2015 to 16, you get a plot that looks a little bit like this spaghetti. Uh, the winter starts to accumulate um, in Omaha, typically uh, the earliest is in October. Most get going in November. Some years we don't take off until that December 1st start. Uh, you get sort of a fanning out of, of the uh, years through, say, December and into early January. Your, your high years tend to separate from your low years. Um, and then things level off towards spring. Maybe some years stop accumulating pretty early, say in March, while others might get a little late snow and we don't stop accumulating till April or even May. Through the climatology, our average, when you total up all those points, is 649 in Omaha. By itself, it doesn't mean that much, but when we put it into context and compare other years, it's when those numbers start to matter more. Uh, our plus and minus standard deviation takes us from 462 to 835. Our lowest is 311 and our highest is 1129. Uh, the solid red line here on the bottom with a label of number two, that was actually last year's winter at 367. We can take a single year and break apart its temperature and snowfall contributions. What I'm showing you is the year of 2009 to 10. It's our second highest accumulation on record in Omaha and uh, is a good example of a recent fairly extreme winter. Um, so the red line represents the total accumulation for that winter. The red dashed line is an average. So you can see we were significantly above average for our Aussie accumulation for the year. Uh, the dashed blue component represents our temperature contribution on average, and the solid blue is our temperature contribution that year. So you can see it was a little bit above average. Um, the steep uh, increase, though, really came with our snowfall, which here in the green line and the green dash line typically comes in you know, down below 200, but in the winter of 2009 to 10, we had a significant snowfall contribution, well over 500. So the extremity of the winter of 2009 to 10 really came a lot more from the snowfall than it did from the temperature. Across our period of record, you can actually look at this and eyeball that the temperature contribution in Omaha is relatively steady. You get some fluctuations, but it certainly doesn't vary as much as the snowfall contribution. So in Omaha, what that tells us is to make or break an extreme winter season, you almost have to get a fairly extreme snowfall to happen, too. Um, our lowest years can have a lower temperature contribution for sure, uh, but they also typically have a lower snowfall contribution than normal. So a few of our stats that we show, you know, I mentioned the 649. Uh, our average start date to winter is November 15th. Our earliest was October of 1970. Our latest has been December 1st seven times through our record, actually eight if you add this year. Our average end date is April 1st. Um, again, uh, we have ended at the end of February before. That's either the 28th or the 29th, depending on leap years. Our latest ending is May 3rd, and we actually came close to this. Uh, we had a second latest ending just a couple years ago, which means our average length of winter is 139 days. We have had one winter that went from December 1st through February 29th, that's our shortest on record. The longest on record was in 93-94. Uh, interestingly, at most sites, there is no correlation between the length of winter and the severity of it. So uh, for people who wonder if we have a uh, hard winter because it started early, the answer to that is typically not. Our initial study of this looked at a couple dozen sites around the country, and this is small print, and maybe you can't see all of it right on your screen, but it probably is no surprise that in our initial sample, the, the most extreme winters, the most severe winters, on average, tend to happen in places like International Falls, Duluth, Sault Ste. Marie, and Fargo. And in our initial sample, some of the mildest winters tend to happen in Dallas-Fort Worth, Atlanta, Oklahoma City, and 
uh, DC Reagan Airport. It's a, kind of interesting though to compare years that, or sites that are near each other and see where they fall on the spectrum. For example, Omaha, uh, here in the middle of the spectrum, has winters that compare in severity pretty closely to Moline and to Denver. So Moline I would have suspected, Denver may be a little bit surprising. I'm also a little disappointed to learn that uh, while I moved west thinking I might get milder winters, um, Detroit ranks milder than Omaha on average and maybe I made a wrong choice there. Well, this is all good and fine when you have snowfall data in hand, but I think many of us listening to this webinar probably know that snowfall data uh, have concerns. They're sometimes uh, missing or not reliable or don't extend as far back as the temperature data in your period of record. And we wanted to also be able to address this issue with Aussie. So what we created was basically a, a subversion, a calculated version um, to use precipitation data as a proxy for snow data in the Aussie. And we label it P-Aussie just for short. Why would we do that? Because um, we can examine historical records, oh, say, the long winter of 1880 to 81, where we don't have snowfall records. Um, because when we get concerns in, uh, from people or from ourselves about the reliability of snowfall records, we can remove them, just use the precipitation record, and recalculate. Um, also, an interesting twist on using this without snow is if we're using a calculation that takes surface temperature and precipitation into account, we might sneak in getting some of those freezing rain events. Um, if we have precipitation that fell below freezing, it's going to get counted, um, and maybe it wasn't snow, but it probably had an impact. So we do this by what we call a snow proxy, an estimate of the snowfall and then a calculation of snow depth. Um, I'm not going to take you guys too terribly through our methodology. It is in the paper. I'll link to it at the end. But in short, we broke precipitation intensity into four categories, from light to heavy, and temperature from colder to milder temperatures. This was based on a, a, a preprint, actually, from Charles Fisk in 2007 uh, with the Applied Climatology Conference. Uh, it's an empirical calculation that was uh, mainly based in Minneapolis-St. Paul. And it worked, well, it worked really well in Minneapolis-St. Paul. It worked pretty well across most of our area, uh, certainly in the colder climates. In our milder climate sites, we did notice that it struggled a little bit with uh, some of the mild temperature and uh, moderate to heavy combinations. Um, they maybe overestimated the frozen precipitation in that combination. And also, for some reason, it doesn't work that well in the warmer lake effect regions of the Great Lakes. Uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Houghton Lake, those areas seemed OK. But Buffalo, uh, Albany, Rochester in that area, for some reason, it isn't doing well in that area. Um, it's going to require some further calculation to figure out what might work for them. But um, it's a limitation of this as well if you're in that area. But for most sites, the correlations were pretty good. Uh, these are Minneapolis-St. Paul in the orange and Urbana, in, uh, Urbana, Illinois in the blue. Our R squared for both was at 0.93, uh, certainly a reliable calculation. But more importantly, the calculated version, which is in the dashed line, just compares pretty well by eyeball to the data version, the obs observed snowfall version, which is in the solid line. Um, it's capturing the character of the winter, and that's really what was important to us. Even if the numbers aren't an exact match, it's capturing the characters of those winters. The highs and the lows, the relative peaks and mins, do fairly well across the board. So for example, uh, back in the winter of 2013 to 14, uh, some of you in the Great Lakes area might recall that it was a particularly nasty one. Oh, sorry, Steve. It was a particularly extreme one. Uh, Detroit uh, actually set a record Aussie high for the period of 1950 to 51 through the present at that time. Uh, and really blew past it. It wasn't, wasn't even close. The previous record was in that purple line that you see on the graph. Um, well, that's, that's interesting for, for that period. But you can also look now with this calculated version at the longer period of record and put that value into context to see that 2014 and 1978 were fairly close, depending on whether you use the observed or calculated versions. One or the other of them was a little bit higher. Um, but what else is interesting to see is those types of winters are very rare now, but they used to happen a lot more. It used to be fairly normal to get an extreme winter up in Detroit, uh, at least up, uh, equivalent to the winter of 2013 to 14. Sometime around the 19-teens, it became much harder to do that. Uh, 
what can we attribute that to? I would say almost certainly a climate change signal in that area, uh, maybe some other factors as well. But what that says to us is um, it's not outside the range of possibilities for a winter like 2013 to 14 to happen in Detroit, uh, but people might not experience it more than once in their lifetimes. So the memory in Detroit of how to deal with a winter of that extremity becomes a little bit more challenging. There are a number of ways you can follow and track Aussie through the year. Uh, thanks to our partners with the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, we are able to run Aussie live, updating daily for all of the sites that you see a, a circle or a diamond on this map. Um, the website is there, and I'll also list it at the end for those who want to access the website. Again, the sites are color-coded by the Aussie category at, that the site is in to date. And you can see, for example, on this map in Omaha, there is a red diamond, meaning not only is it mild category, but we are record mild here to date. Not that far away, up in South Dakota, you have a couple of sites that are running in the extreme category to date. Uh, at an eyeball, it really lets you see where winter has been hitting a little bit harder or has been taking it kind of easy relative to the climatology of each of those sites. This doesn't mean that uh, Duluth, with its red dot, um, is more mild than, let's say, Portland, Oregon, or Boise, Idaho. It just means that relative to its own climatology, Duluth's winter um, has been quite mild. And relative to its own climatology, Boise's winter has been quite extreme. When you click on any one of those dots, you'll get a map that looks a lot like this, and again lets you see how the winter is tracking to date. Here you can see for Omaha, we are tracking well below our average curve, which would be in the yellow, and in fact are a record mild and have been for several days now. Uh, you can also mouse over this when you're live on the website and get a readout of what the percentile breakdowns are, uh, which helps you at a glance figure out if you're really close to the borderline of a percentile category or if you're really pegged in one direction or the other. Uh, this comes in handy for uh, describing your winter to date pretty quickly and easily um, when the media calls you and says, are we having a mild winter this year or not? Behind the scenes, uh, this is pulled from a spreadsheet that we run to actually make those calculations. Once again, looking at Omaha as an example, you see our average curve there that you've seen on other maps, and the dashed lines on either side are a plus or a minus standard deviation. Near the top, you see our five most extreme winters, and near the bottom, you see the lowest on record and last season. So uh, here in Omaha, again, we are tracking well below normal. And really, it would take in Omaha um, not just average conditions, but uh, it would take more severe than usual conditions to bring us up even higher into the mild category, let alone to approach a moderate category or something higher. At this point, we're almost locked into being in a mild category for the season, barring some kind of very extreme event. Uh, at the end of last season, this was the map of uh, winter extremity across the United States. This is available on the Midwestern Regional Climate site as well. Um, and again, last winter was a pretty mild one across the board. There were a couple of sites in the mountains that approached severe extremity, but for most of us, it was a, an average to mild winter. We don't have maps like this created for all the years on record. Uh, that's something the Midwest Regional Climate Center actually is going to be working on, is creating end-of-year maps for all of these sites. But um, there have been some interesting displays and applications of the data. And I don't know how many of you follow Brian Brett Schneider on Twitter, uh, but he likes to look at this. He has actually run the calculations for some sites in Canada and Alaska and some additional sites in the CONUS. Um, so he plotted this up for last year, too, showing that it was not only a mild winter for the CONUS, but also extending through Canada and into Alaska. Uh, this is a nice shaded map showing, again, the percentile for winter severity across the CONUS and in Alaska. And this was the end of 2014 to 15. Again, we were running fewer sites then, and we haven't gone back to redraw these maps. But uh, 2014 to 15 did have a little more severity to it. Uh, up in the Great Lakes to the uh, Mid-Atlantic and New England, this was an extreme winter, and in a couple of sites, a record extreme winter again, using 1950 to 51 uh, to present data. There are a number of other potential applications to this, to this data, and I think the number of these are, are growing all the time. We're hearing of more uses or more areas of interest for applying Aussie. Uh, simply creating a climatology mapped out like this, again, courtesy of Brian Brett Schneider, um, 
lets you see sites that maybe have some kind of similarity to their winters climatologically. The character of them might be a little different. For example, um, although dark blue may extend from southern Michigan across to the High Plains, the dark blue in southern Michigan is a little bit warmer and quite a bit snowier, uh, where the dark blue in the High Plains is uh, drier and colder kind of a, a winter. We've had a good number of uh, data requests, people who want to track down what's going on. Local media certainly pick up on this and get interested, especially if we're pegging toward one extreme or the other. Um, and you all uh, out in the forecast offices have been great about asking us questions. Um, if you have sites of interest that have a pretty reliable record and you want them added to this database, you can give us a, a email and let us know and we can try to get that added in. Um, the media, the national media, are starting to use the Aussie more and more. This uh, screen capture was actually just last week from the Weather Channel. Weather Nation has also run with it, as has WGN. Um, for some reason, the state of Wisconsin seems to enjoy this index. There have been several requests from Wisconsin of, from different services and entities uh, applying this to fish and wildlife studies, for example, or to FEMA applications. And some departments of transportation have also picked up on this, um, wanting to relate winter severity to their expenditures or their planning purposes. Uh, I mentioned the possibility of using OSSI to look at climate variability. And one thing we can do is composite this. Those of you who have been through some climate training in the Weather Service may see these graphs a lot. But for those who don't, um, this is a graph of the distribution of years that are in each category, El Nino, Neutral, and La Nina, and the very dark shaded bars around years uh, mean that that's some kind of a statistically significant signal. So in this example, at Minneapolis-St. Paul in the months of December, January, February, in La Nina, there's a significantly higher than usual chance for Aussie to run high, in other words, for the winter to be on the extreme side. There's a significantly low chance for Aussie to run low, or in other words, there's a low chance that the winter is going to be uh, a mild one. Here in Omaha, we again look at this graph I have of all of the years plotted out, but um, just for fun, last year when we had a, a El Nino going, um, I looked at all the years in our record that had a El Nino of moderate or higher strength. Um, only two of those ended up plotting in the uh, anywhere near above average, and many of them were among our milder winters. Um, it wasn't a statistically you know, robust examination, but it, what it did say was, at least in the past, our chances of having a below average Aussie were certainly higher in an El Nino than they are usually. Um, we can also look at the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation, as an application. And again, this is for uh, Omaha, but for December through March. And um, this may not come as a surprise either, but when we have a negative NAO, we don't tend to run mild in Omaha. If we have a positive NAO, we do. Um, and uh, that's a pretty strong and robust signal in a lot of places, actually. NAO has a pretty significant impact on our winters across the central and eastern United States. But it bears out in the Aussie, too. And finally, here I use that uh, calculated version of Aussie, so not using the snowfall data here, using precipitation data, looking at several sites to look at uh, trends. You know, trends are interesting when you look at Aussie because you're combining two factors, temperature and snowfall, or precipitation. And uh, temperature across virtually all the sites is trending warmer. But snowfall is not necessarily trending in the same direction everywhere. So there can be some sites where temperature might be trending milder, but snowfall might be trending toward an increase, which kind of cancels each other out, and you end up with trends that don't go much of anywhere. The orange line at the top is Duluth, and Duluth has not been trending when you look at the Aussie calculation, likely because their snowfall is offsetting their temperature trends. Uh, some other sites, uh, Madison, Wisconsin being a good example in the purple, um, a milder trend. And here on South Dakota, the temperature trend is definitely not being offset by a snowfall trend. That trend for the Aussie calculation is going down pretty steeply. So one exciting future application of this is actually an ongoing project right now. Uh, Steve and I are partnering with the Climate Prediction Center to use the CFS climate forecast system model and create an envelope of 
future winter severity. Looking out through the next, say, two to six weeks, uh, we're going to be projecting a plume of possible Aussie ac accumulations. Uh, and when you compare that to an average Aussie accumulation, you might be able to see, for example, that we might be entering a period of unusually severe winter conditions or unusually mild winter conditions. Uh, I look forward to this being a decision support application of the Aussie and uh, something we'll maybe be able to uh, get going and, and have available in real time, at least at some sites. Uh, we are working on it right now behind the scenes. We don't have anything on public display just yet, but I think we're close. Uh, and if we don't have it by the end of this winter, it'll certainly be running by next winter. So now, because um, this was my original question, I wanted to come back and show you how I've been able to apply OSSEA to this historical analysis of the long winter. Um, if we look at the severity of 1880 to 81 compared to climatology, uh, this is for all the sites that we had available to us with data that goes back to 1880 to 81. Um, all of those purple sites experienced an extreme winter in 1880 to 81. Uh, the swath is pretty extensive. Um, it covers certainly from the northern Rockies across the southern to central plains and then over into at least a few sites in the mid-Atlantic. I think um, we can expand this in time and get more sites plotted up so we can see what the coverage of that, those extreme conditions really were. Uh, DeSmet, by the way, where Laura was during that winter is in the green circle there in the middle. We don't have data in DeSmet, of course, but it's surrounded by purples. It's surrounded by extreme to record extreme conditions. Uh, for all of the sites that we did analyze, the purple dot represents the severity of the winter of 1880 to 81. The boxes in the box and whisker are the inner 25th to 75th percentile. The upper dot is, of course, the max severity, and the lower dot is the min. You know, what this tells you is that um, sites like Yankton and Helena, Montana, had their record extreme winter in 1880 to 81. Most of the sites in the area were quite close to the top, but there were some exceptions. You know, if you just look at where the purple dots fall, uh, Duluth, DLH there at the bottom, had a, had a fairly severe winter, but not anywhere near their record, for example. Um, but all in all, eyeballing those across the board, it was a fairly significant winter. In fact, we can rank them all, and again, this is a lot of numbers, making the point that it was the worst winter on record at several sites. Um, those forts data are, uh, were made available through the Climate Database Modernization Project. Uh, that doesn't run anymore, but uh, they are historical data that were digitized, giving us access to places like Fort Randall and some old data in Yankton, South Dakota that were housed by military uh, records and other such places. Um, what's interesting to note is that even though it may not have been the uh, highest Ossian record at Minneapolis-St. Paul, Minnesota, for example, it was the highest snowfall component of Aussie on record in those sites, um, giving some credence to Laura's stories that perhaps there really was snow after snow, and uh, the historical records that say 13, 14 feet of snow fell through the season up in the Dakotas to Minnesota seems pretty plausible and reliable. Um, going back to this map, the dots are still the same colors from the winter of 1880 to 81, but the numbers plotted on there are now uh, the number, uh, the, it's the year that is the most severe on record for those sites. So drawing in the purple here, these are the, this is the region, these are the sites where the winter of 1880 to 81 ranks as the record extreme. Um, it does include a, a good part of the Central Plains into Iowa and then up and across over to Montana. Uh, maybe DeSmet is or isn't in that bubble, uh, we can't say without data there, but you know, kind of close enough, perhaps. Um, one of the questions we had when we first started researching this is um, if there were any winters that were of comparable severity. Again, I've listed a lot there, and you know, I'm not going to read through all of them and describe each one of them. The point I want to make is that there were several winters that were of comparable severity in the region. Um, Two points to make on those. One is that, again, a lot of them are from the 19-teens and earlier. Once you get past the 19-teens, they are very few and far between. Um, and the second point to make is that we have had winters that are that severe since the winter of 1880 to 81. So why does that one have such a legend attached to it? Why does it have such a story? Partly because Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote about it, to be sure, but it's in the town histories and the culture of this region uh, even without her stories. So there's something else about that winter that made it feel very extreme. Um, and 
its recurrence interval isn't one of those things. This winter, this kind of winter does happen. It has happened in the past. It happened numerous times in Laura's lifetime there. Uh, but something about it made it bad. And if you want to know that story, I think that's a separate webinar, but uh, there are some potential reasons there. Of interest, too, is that the most recent of these comparable severity winters, uh, 2013 to 14, would certainly qualify in the Great Lakes. You had your long winter, my Great Lakes friends, and a good number of us in, say, uh, parts of the Corn Belt over toward Nebraska had their long winters in the late 1970s. So what are some other extreme winters? If this is the region of the winter of 1880 to 81 being the most extreme, there's a pretty significant swath up here where the most extreme winter was 1874 to 75. Uh, another interesting side story is that Laura was living in that region and was a child at the time uh, during that winter, yet that winter didn't seem to strike her very much in her stories. It isn't really described as a hard winter in her books. Here's the region where the 1977 to 78 winter was the most severe. And in the green, uh, that would be where the net was, uh, winter of 1978 to 79 was the most severe. So again, that was just one uh, application of that data. And I think there are a lot of stories to be told from tracking down where the, where the most extreme winters were and when, uh, or when the most mild ones were and when. There's a publication available from uh, the, uh, the uh, AMS journals on this, the Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climatology. Again, here's the website from the Midwestern Regional Climate Center to track that Aussie value live, updated every day at a lot of sites across the country. And once again, I'll encourage you if you have any questions, if you want to see a site added, uh, if you have ideas for applications, any of those things, you can feel free to send me an email and I'll be happy to get in touch with you. Uh, I think this winter, Barb is the one who's cheering and Steve is the one who's a little bit disappointed because our winters have been mild. Um, but. Uh, I think uh, this has let Steve and I at least understand that what's his extreme and my extreme might be different, but we can put it in context. And uh, with that, I am happy to take any questions now, or if you're uh, listening to the recording of this on, on the webinar page, then again, feel free to email me and I'll answer your questions that way. Great. Thanks, Barb. So at this time, we will take questions. Um, so again, you can type your questions in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, so I'm going to be monitoring that over the next few minutes to see what questions come in. Um, so right now there's not any questions in, but um, Barb, thanks so much for that overview. I think it's a great tool, and I, I really do think it's exciting, um, the work that's going to be done with CPC. I think that will be a great um, decision support tool moving forward, as you mentioned. Um, so yeah, so please feel free to enter your questions in the control panel, um, and we'll, I'll be monitoring that. Someone commented and said they, there is a whiskey in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, Brian Brush Schneider is running uh, Aussie for a few sites in Alaska. He's using our methodology and he has had a good conversations with us to make sure we're consistent. We left Alaska out of the initial calculations because, well, Alaska is always a unique challenge and one of their unique challenges is that uh, what they consider to be the start and end of winter may not really fit uh, compared to what we would consider in the CONUS. Okay, we did get another question. How to expand AWSC for more co-op sites? Um, again, if you have any sites that you'd like to see uh, with us running OSSI, these are either co-op or first order station sites. Uh, we'd like to see sites that have a long record and have fairly complete data so that we can use the snowfall data. The values you see on the website are using the snowfall calculation, not the precipitation calculation. So if there's a lot of missing snow data, it doesn't work very well. If you have a site like that, just email me and Steve and I will get on it. We do prioritize based on things like filling gaps in regional coverage, um, sites that might be of interest for historical reasons, for example, uh, currently running an extreme winter or some, something like that. Um, but we do keep a queue of sites to add. Okay, and the next question, could the snowfall trend increase possibly be due to the increase in temperature? So it would make sense that the temperature and snowfall trend go hand in hand. Yes, absolutely. Um, this isn't a, a really exhaustive look into the climate change trends that we see, and I think I'd want to use some homogenized data to make that really a robust calculation. But um, certainly it is, it is consistent meteorologically in a lot of, region, in a lot of regions 
for the increase in temperature and increase in snowfall to go hand in hand. So even though Aussie itself might look flatlined, um, there are certainly changes going on. They're just happening sort of below the surface of the Aussie calculation. Okay, great. And the next question, are there different thresholds or criteria for different regions of the U.S.? Every site is held to the same thresholds. Um, what difference what differentiates each site is that, of course, the percentiles at one site will be very different from percentiles at the other. So, you know, to get a, an Aussie accumulation started in Atlanta, you still need the maximum temperature to stay below freezing or a measurable snowfall, just like you do up in Duluth. But the climatology looks a lot different, and what makes an extreme winter in Atlanta is a much lower threshold than what makes an extreme winter in Duluth. Okay, and then we did have a comment from Steve. I think it's pertaining back to the co-op question. Um, he said the sites also need to be currently measuring snowfall and snow depth. Thank you, Steve. Okay, and then the next question or comment in question. Great work. If season ends by March 1st, please explain how some winters are deemed to end much later. <laughs> well, the season ends on March 1st as long as there's no snow after March 1st or the temperature stays, the maximum temperature stays above freezing. But if one of those things happens after March 1st, then we keep calculating winter. It does make it a little bit tricky to say when winter has ended. For example, in Omaha, it's like I said, our, our usual ending date is around April 1st, but uh, we've had winter that extends into May by having snowfall in May. Um, so, you know, I'm never really comfortable saying we are done with winter until well into spring, even though winter calculation might have actually ceased, say, in early to mid-March. Uh, but it's the last of whichever of those conditions comes last that puts a close on the winter. Okay, and then this question, so it's simply based off the standard deviations of the site. I think that might be referring back to the question of the snowfall trend increase and in, increase in temperature. Um, if it's a question by itself, the categories are based on the percentiles, 0 to 20th, 20 to 40th, 40 to 60th, 60 to 80th, and above 80th percentiles. Um, as far as the trends, that's a uh, trend calculation with a statistical significance measure on it. Okay, so that's all the questions we have in the pane right now. Um, so again, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in there um, and type them in. Um, but it looks like that's it for now. Yeah, so it looks like that's all the questions that we have coming in. So um, thanks again, Barb, for giving this presentation. And we're getting some comments saying thank you as well from, from the participants. Um, so thanks, everyone, for attending and participating in the presentation. Um, we should get this posted online in the next couple of days, um, and I will send out the link in the video to that. So thanks again for your participation, and this concludes our webinar for today.